Hello. Um, my name is Benoit Not. I'm a software engineer at Credio, and I will talk about profiling and optimizing Spark jobs um, with tools we developed. Um, first, before we begin, a few words about Credio. Um, we're in the online advertisement business, and our motto is connecting shoppers with things and need and love. So the idea is to, to present um, users with relevant advertisement, relevant products, relevant services, and only present those advertisements to uh, users that might be interested in it. Um, and to do so, we use a lot of machine learning. And because we use uh, machine learning, we need to store and process a lot of data. And for that, we've built a Hadoop cluster. Um, just a few numbers about the cluster. It's half a petabyte of data ingested daily, 15 petabytes of data read daily, and more than 4,000 nodes. Uh, it's uh, close to 100,000 CPU cores on the cluster, which makes it um, the largest Hadoop cluster in Europe. And um, because we've got so many products, um, we have a very diverse ecosystem running on top of it, uh, from MapReduce to MapRe and MapReduce-based frameworks, cascading, scalding, to other frameworks, Spark, Flink, um, SQL engines as well, such as Ive and Presto. And so recently, um, teams who are refactoring products or building new products um, move away from MapReduce-based frameworks to new alternatives. And uh, one very popular alternative is Spark. Um, one main reason is that it advertises very fast and efficient processing on Hadoop. So it seems like a, a very good choice, right? That, that's what they advertise on their website. And so teams, um, a lot of teams, um, build their new products on top of Spark. Um, the problem is that we didn't see um, more efficiency or faster processing. In fact, we saw a lot of instability um, between containers lost, um, out of memory heroes. Uh, yarn killing our containers on the cluster, randomly, it seems. Uh, also, jobs taking way too long uh, for processing. Um, clearly, it wasn't what we expected, and so um, jobs are very, very, were very unstable, and teams were solving this instability by just allocating a lot more memory uh, or resources to their jobs compared to what uh, we had before, which was uh, not a viable um, solution for the long term on the cluster because it has a cost, uh, infrastructure cost mainly. And so clearly we needed to better understand what was happening under the hood for the Spark jobs to better be able to tune them and optimize them uh, so that they um, are good citizens on our cluster. Um, for this, we decided to build a small tool, a profiler for distributed applications on Hadoop, which we called Baba. Um, we use it uh, with Spark, but not only. Uh, it's not really tied to any framework. We use it with Spark, as I said, but also Scalding, Ive. It should work with Flink if you uh, use Flink. Um, and there were four main reasons why I wanted to develop um, this profiler. First, uh, it needed to be very easy to get started with. Um, there exist other profilers. Uh, you may have heard of StatsD, for instance, but they all require infrastructure, whether it's a database, whether it's uh, some con code being installed on your compute nodes, or that was a very high barrier of entry, uh, of entry for users, and that explained why nobody was actually using them uh, at Credio. Um, second, uh, it needed to be made for distributed applications because their distributed nature makes them very hard to observe from start to end. If you want to really see the, the ent entirety of your job, uh, the profile needs to be made for that. Uh, third, it needs to work at scale because sometimes um, everything works fine in pre-production data and sample data. And once you move to production data, then every, everything goes bad and you need to understand what's, ha what's happening uh, at that scale. So it needs to work with uh, large-scale apps. And finally, um, results need to be very easy to understand because um, teams don't want to spend uh, a lot of time trying to figure out how to explore the results. And because it's been useful to us, uh, we've open sourced it. It's on GitHub, um, on our GitHub account. So it's uh, github.com slash critio slash baba if you fancy having a look. And so if we um, talk about architecture quickly, um, so Babar comes with um, a Java agent. So it's a jar that you can attach to the executor JVMs and that will instrument the JVM. So it will get metrics uh, from the JVM. It will sample also your stack traces, and it will get metrics from the operating system if you use Linux, uh, so that you can get metrics not only for your Java code, but also native libraries uh, for compression, decompression, uh, Python uh, code that you may run outside of the JVM on your executors, and so on. And so those metrics will be um, locked to the local file system, and when your application completes, Yarn aggregates your uh, container logs to a single file on Hadoop, on HDFS. And Baba just needs to process this file to build a final um, uh, report as an HTML file. So if we look at 
uh, what the report looks like. It's, uh, so as I said, an HTML file that team members can send through Slack, uh, archive on, on their wiki pages and so on. And there are six main tabs in this report. Uh, the first one is containers. So it's interesting to see your containers lifecycle, how many containers are running at any given time, um, also the, um, the timeline of each container. Then we've got memory, how much memory you use and reserve on your infrastructure, which is hard to um, otherwise uh, have a good idea of what's happening. Um, on Yarn and with Spark. Um, CPU as well, are your executors using um, CPU? Um, where are the bottlenecks? Uh, garbage collection to tune your memory, I.O. and uh, finally uh, traces. So your stack traces at Babar samples presented as flame graphs. And so let's start with flame graphs. Um, if you don't know what flame graphs are, it's a visualization to quickly identify expensive code paths in your code base. And so imagine we've got a very simple application represented by this pseudocode. There is a root method A calling two methods B and C, and each of those two methods are in turn calling a, a last method D. So if we want to build a flame graph for, for this application, we just have a root method A, as I said, and a call stack from top to bottom. So parent method will be at the top, general method right underneath that. So as I said, A is calling method B, which in turn is calling method D. And d when D and B complete, then A is calling C, which is calling D, and then the application um, completes. So vert the vertical ax axis is a call stack, and the horizontal axis represents CPU time. So the, the width of the block is proportional to the CPU time they spend. And so because A, the root method, is 100% CPU time, and B being only 40% of the width of A is 40% CPU time. And so here we can see D would be 20% CPU time. So it's very interesting because not only you can see wh which code paths are used in your application, but you can also see how expensive they are on CPU time. And so that's very convenient to, uh, for instance, optimize a job and avoid premature optimization. Because sometimes you optimize something and you realize at the end or too late that actually it was not uh, the bottleneck of your application. So let's apply that to a sample job. Uh, imagine we're joining two data sets. So we spark a very simple join. We open two data sets, we read them, uh, we join them, and we write the result to disk. Um, if we profile it with Baba, we'll get the frame graphs of the entire application, not just one executor, but all the executors together. And that will give a frame graph like this. Um, and so, as I said before, it's really convenient to see what's happening inside your application. If you look at this frame graph, we can clearly see the process of uh, this Spark join. So first, we can see we read the data because, as you can see, it's all the parquet input format code. So we can see that uh, reading takes approximately 35% of our, our, our CPU time. Then um, that uh, the records are sorted, uh, map side, and then finally serialized um, for the shuffle. And after the shuffle, the data is deserialized, grouped, so joined, and finally written to disk. So we can clearly see the process and the cost of each step. And here. Uh, we see that reading is very expensive, but we also see that serializing, deserializing for the shuffle is incredibly expensive. And so that's the first thing we can take from, from this uh, flame graph uh, for this join. If we, want to if we want to optimize something, we need to optimize the shuffle, the shuffle stage and basically avoiding serialization because it's not really network and it's not IO that's expensive, that's serialization in this case. And if we wanted to convince ourselves of this fact, we can have a look at the CPU um, time spent by the application. Um, so Baba can give you this graph, which is the median ti uh, CPU time spent by your executors, and both for user and system mode. And if we look, system mode is um, during the shuffle is very uh, insignificant versus user mode, so it's really not disk and I.O., which will happen in system mode. It's really uh, serialization in user mode. So if we want to optimize um, this job, and so we need to optimize uh, probably the shuffle and serialization stage, and so we need to pick models accordingly, because as we've seen, because uh, as serialization is so expensive, it's often more interesting to uh, pick a data representation for your, for your data, for your records, so the models, uh, that will serialize and deserialize very efficiently instead of trying to minimize the footprint in memory. And also using specialized serializers can be a huge gain. In our case, uh, using, uh, so for this join, using uh, specialized serializers can be 40% CPU gain time gain, not only because it will serialize better, but also because Spark is able to uh, apply further optimizations when it has um, custom serializers for each of your classes. And uh, if we looked at the flame graph, we could see that it's really in the sort phase that Spark is able to optimize um, by using uh, an IO-based sort. Um, and another place where we're not expecting the model's um, choice to, to have an impact is in the size estimation of the objects. Uh, if you know Spark, Spark 
partitions its memory into three different um, areas, um, user, um, user memory, execution memory, and storage memory, and in order to be able to know how much, mem how much of this memory is used, Spark needs to estimate the size of the object, and it does so by going through the object recursively. And that can be very expensive. We can see here that we're spending, um, in this frame graph, we can see that we're spending 18% of the CPU time just estimating the size of our objects. And in some cases, it can be even worse. We've seen up to 30% CPU time spent just estimating the size um, uh, with uh, very large JSON objects with hundreds of columns. So picking models can be a huge optimization for these kind of joints um, in, this, uh, as in this example. And so now that we've seen that we can profile um, to try to optimize our code path, try to remove uh, inefficiencies in our in our code, uh, we can also have a look at what's happening for the memory allocation, because memory is often a difficult topic with Spark, and sometimes uh, you need to re, um, deep dive to uh, set the memory correctly, set the memory settings um, correctly. And so if we want to see how is memory used by our example join on the cluster, Spark can provide that. Uh, uh, Babar can provide this graph. So first, there is a graph about total used memory. So here we can see first the total JVM heap memory used on your cluster, so the Java heap memory. So that's the sum at any moment in your application of uh, the amount of heap memory used by all your executors. We see that we peak at 200 gigabytes of heap memory for this example join. But heap memory is not Every, uh, everything that's on your memory stick. It's not everything that's on your physical memory because you will have, on top of heap memory, you will have some Java overhead and you will have some um, native libraries, for instance, for compression, decompression, or um, out, of um, out of heap uh, buffers for uh, the shuffle phase. So Babar can also show you the physical memory used. So we can see that while we are using 200 gigabytes of heap memory, we are actually using 300 gigabytes of physical memory. So we need to account for that when, when we are dimensioning our job. And finally, it can show um, the reserve memory. So that's the memory you ask your cluster to give to your application, and that's not available to any other application in the cluster. So it's really important to uh, not over-reserve memory, because otherwise it's just wasted. It's not uh, available to other applications, and you're not using it. And so it's very important for uh, Spark jobs and for uh, large, large applications, actually, to dimension and tune your memory correctly. And that's often a very difficult topic, um, because if you don't tune it correctly, your application will die. And if you allocate too much, um, you will, will over-reserve uh, and um, allocate memory. So first, um, one thing that you need to set with a Spark application is the executor memory. So that's basically the heap memory uh, settings. And so if we look at another graph that Baba provides, it's a maximum used memory for any container. So it represents the largest container at any time in your application. That's very useful to dimension uh, the memory settings. So here we can see that at most, the largest container will use at most 5 gigabytes of heap memory. So we can set the executor memory just over these 5 gigabytes, giving a bit of headroom, uh, but not too much. Uh, so we could give 6.5 gigabytes. And so that's the executor memory. And now we need to reserve the memory on the cluster to accommodate not only for JVM heap memory, but for the physical memory, as I discussed um, before. And so if we look at physical memory, we see that actually we are uh, over 7 gigabytes. So we need to reserve enough memory um, so that we can accommodate for the 7 gigabytes. So we, um, the reserve memory is the Spark executor memory plus the overhead memory. And so we need to set those values so that we reserved over seven, so approximately 7.5 gigabytes of memory, for instance. And we can see um, that we have, are fitting the largest executor tightly inside the reserve memory. So we are not allocating too much and not too little. Otherwise, uh, Yarn would just kill our applications, which is a very common uh, thing when you're first uh, writing your, your new Spark jobs. And finally, um, when you're uh, dimensioning memory, uh, there is also the issue of uh, garbage collection. Because um, if you allocate too much uh, JVM memory, then you don't have issues with garbage collection, but then most of this memory is wasted. Otherwise, if you allocate too little, then garbage collection will, be, uh, will spend a significant uh, amount of CPU time in your application, and that's probably a bad thing, and that's uh, c wasted CPU time somehow. So uh, Babar can help you with that as well, because we can see um, the garbage collection me metrics uh, for your um, executors, but not only uh, just the garbage collection uh, values that Spark will give you, but more detailed, uh, more detailed one, because we know how much major and minor GC we are doing. So that's helpful to dimension not only your heap memory, but also the, the generations inside, inside of it. And we've seen sometimes with, uh, for instance, machine learning algorithms, when we've got very large uh, vectors in memory, that uh, dim uh, redimensioning generations is more uh, important than redimensioning the JVM heap memory. 
So, um, as I said, we've seen that profiling can help you first understand what's happening inside your applications because those frameworks are often uh, black boxes. Um, when you write your first Spark job, you don't really know what's happening underneath. And so having, for instance, the stack traces is incredibly useful. Um, second, it's very helpful to optimize what really matters and not uh, optimize something that have uh, no importance. So re-optimizing for your CPU time, a uh, profile, uh, profiler is very incredibly useful. And finally, it helps uh, understand the, the resources allocation and how to better tune it uh, so that your application behaves um, as good as it can on your infrastructure. And so because uh, this tool, Baba, has helped us so much, we, saw, we think it can be useful to other people too. And we've open sourced it, as I said before. Uh, again, it's on uh, github.com um, slash critio slash Baba. Uh, it's a very simple tool, uh, very nice to have a look at. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so there are many things that won't fit in 20 minutes, but if you want to discuss about this project or other projects we've got at Credio, we've got a booth uh, in the next room, and feel free to come um, see us and have a talk with us. Uh, a bunch of us are here in Berlin. I think we've got time for questions. Great. Hi, thanks for the talk. So in my experience, some jobs um, um, use a lot of off-heap uh, memory. Um, and I, I know that uh, one thing it, they use it for is uh, for these buffers to read the shuffle files. Mm. So uh, do you know about any other uh, thing that, that, uh, that uses this off-heap memory and why it is so, so large? Because uh, intuitively, I think just buffers cannot be so, so big. So. Yeah, there are a few things. Um, so buffers for shuffle, definitely. Um, there is also a native codex for compression, decompression. If you write, for instance, Parquet files and you use uh, gzip or LZ4, you can get better performance by using native codex uh, that Hadoop can provide. They need to be compiled for your architecture, but they will provide much better performance and they work with off-heap memory because they are native code. Um, a third thing is that um, when you use, for instance, five gigabytes of heap memory, uh, Java needs to commit more memory so that it has available memory to grow your heap. And this uh, committed memory, which is called committed memory, and Baba can show uh, there is a, a graph for that as well, um, will increase the physical memory use. Even if you don't use this uh, available heap memory, it will be committed and it will take some physical memory, which is why we see so, so much uh, headroom over the heap memory. Um, so we don't we don't run it on. So we do first we don't run it in production because there is still some overhead um, CPU time, a few percent at most, and memory as well. And so it's not really desirable. Um, what we do is we run it on very large jobs, jobs that we are developing, and we know they will take a lot of um, resources. We want to optimize them before we release them to production. And for production, otherwise we use other tools uh, such as Doctor Elephant, for instance, uh, made by LinkedIn. Um, which is, um, doesn't take any overhead on your application, just processes um, the logs, the final logs. Um, yeah. So it's more um, exp um, to explore what's happening before you release in production. But we run sometimes on production data. Um, sorry, I haven't got the question. Maybe it was very similar to my question. But um, can you talk a bit about the runtime costs? Uh, so. Especially, so I've seen you, you're using Baba for reporting, right? And uh, also um, you have shown some profiling. So my assumption would be you are not using the profiling in the production system, right? But uh, are you using then the reporting uh, stuff in production? And what are the costs there? So, um, yeah, it, it was a bit similar. Uh, we don't use Baba in production uh, because there is quite some overhead. We could, uh, we've measured it. It's a few percent in CPU time and it's a few uh, dozens of megabytes in memory. Um, but what Baba provides is probably too, um, too much information to, to rerun run it in production because you won't be able to do much of it. We, we do use it to uh, optimize the jobs before they go to production, some very large jobs that we know will have a large impact on the cluster. Um, but for production jobs, we use other tools such as Dr. Elephant from LinkedIn. Um, which just process the job counters and will give you reports and can also give you hints based on heur heuristics. Um, yeah. So, 
sorry we don't have more time for the questions so thank you very much thank you thank you